In the middle of this winter mission where we're reaching out to the homeless, I had thought and, and wished there'd be one Sunday where we could just read what the Bible has to say about homelessness. Just simply and strictly a sermon on homelessness from Scripture. And so that's this week. That's where we are. This leads us into kind of our Thanksgiving service next week. That won't be a time to preach and teach. That'll just be a time to be thankful. So that'll be one of those two-minute messages, a five-minute sermon kind of thing. Mini talk, just short, um, but really just for us to share. If you remember from a few weeks ago, we watched a TED Talk, a speech by this uh, woman uh, who challenged us to think about a single story and how we can feel like there's one thing that happens in one place and that all people who are in that kind of place must be the same sorts of people. And so certainly homelessness is one of those categories of people. You say the homeless, each of us is going to have some kind of idea of what that looks like. You might think people with drug addictions. That's the reason they're homeless. That's what homeless people are like. And while there are some in that population that struggle with addiction, uh, it's not all, but it is some. But it's also an addiction for people that are people in homes. So, so it's not just a clear dividing line. We might say it's people that have gotten too deeply into debt. And that's true. So sometimes it's a result of mistakes or that people have made, and these are a consequence. But that's, that's not every story. That's some of the stories. I might say that some people desire to live on the streets. And there are some people who, despite the repeated and well-intentioned efforts of ministries like the L Street Mission are trying to help homeless people get off the street, they're like, no, I like it. I want to continue living in the tent in the woods. That's actually by desire, not just something that's been forced upon me. But that's certainly not everybody's story. So there's lots of reasons why homelessness could happen. I've listed, what, two or three there. There's a million. But there's really only one sort of heart for God for the homeless. And that's what I'd like to seek out. For those of us who are blessed enough to have homes, to have jobs, what's our perspective to be? What's our responsibility to be? Even though God knows everyone's story that's brought them to a place of homelessness, how does he look at and love them collectively? Should our love be different? Like, oh, we found out that this person has a drug problem, so that's a homeless person that we're not going to help. We found out that this person had a problem that got them there, so that's their own mistake, so we're not going to help them. God doesn't really make those distinctions. He just talks about poverty and people who are poor and people who are homeless and says when people find themselves in this place for all sorts of different reasons, how can we love them? How does God love them? How does he want to use us to love them? What's our role in their lives? And it actually gets much more simple. <laughs> It gets much more simple as to what our role can be in their lives, regardless of what stories have brought them to where they are. And so that's what I'd like us to do. I'd like us to hone in on Scripture's perspective on how to love, how to listen, how to be there, how to represent Christ. And we have people in this room today that have been homeless at one time or another. We have others in this room today that at one time or another in their life have struggled with addictions. We have people in this room today that have had you know, crises happen and lost their home or lost their jobs. For those people right in our midst here, what if they were just left in that place? What if Jesus said, I'm here to save your soul. Good luck with your life. Jesus doesn't do that. If community can remind us of anything, it's that he actually helped tangible needs and eternal needs. And the danger is that we could get so focused on all the practical needs that we just become a public service organization. We're a soup kitchen now. Well, a church isn't just a soup kitchen, but a, a church can have a soup kitchen. Or we could be so focused on the eternal needs, like let's make sure people know God, that we actually don't help people in the moment. And what I think we're going to see in Scripture here is that God's got an immediate plan and an eternal plan. I think if we keep that focus in mind, it'll help us not to be short-sighted in our love and also not to neglect people in how we love them. So let's look at it. I think we have four passages we're going to go through one by one. We're in Deuteronomy, yes, 15. Deuteronomy chapter 15 is where we're going to start. (coughs) 
I was actually surprised as I was looking for all the different verses the Bible has on poverty, on the poor, on homeless, as I expected all of them to be super familiar, right? We're going to touch on the one from James. That's what we'll close with. You know, if anyone has the world's possessions and sees a brother in need but doesn't meet those needs, what good is it? So it's familiar. I just figured all of them would be familiar. And what I found was there is one after another, after another, and after another that were like completely new to me. I must have read these at some time, but they stood off and jumped off the page in a way that they haven't before, like fresh perspectives from God on poverty and our role. So I want to introduce them to you with that light. And I wonder if some of these might be verses that you've never read before, or when we read them, they feel like just great thoughts, fresh thoughts from God. Um, The first one here in Deuteronomy 15, the basic thought is that in the kingdom of God, poverty is supposed to be temporary. In the kingdom of God, so whether it's the Jewish kingdom, we're going to read how they handled things in the Hebrew Jewish nation of Israel, the kingdom of God, which was a foreshadowing of what is, poverty is supposed to be temporary. It's continual, you know, different people are cycling into it and out of it, it happens and it can, but it's not supposed to be a permanent state, it's supposed to be temporary, and God actually gives them instructions on how to keep it temporary but think about that for the church. You know, remember that in the New Testament, you have all the, the collection for widows and the distribution of food. And so, like, it was, poverty was supposed to be a temporary condition there. Think about the kingdom of God in heaven. Poverty won't exist. There's no such thing as needs and wants and, and wounds and pains. It's a different place. So keep that thought in your mind. And think about how God has got this set up for us to actually work. So Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 7. If anyone among you, or if among you, one of your brothers should become poor in any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God has given you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother, but you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever It may be, but take care, lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart, and you say, the seventh year is near, the year of release is near, and your eye look grudgingly on your poor brother, and you give him nothing, and he cry out to the Lord against you, and you be guilty of sin. You shall give to him freely, your heart shall not be grudging when you give, because for this the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and all that you undertake, for there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy and to the poor in your land. So the the concept of the needy is is obvious here, but he talked about that year of release. What's the year of release? Go back to the beginning of the chapter and fill in the blank there. At the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release. And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor shall release what he has lent to his neighbor. He shall not exact it of his neighbor, his brother, because the Lord's release has been proclaimed. Of a foreigner you may exact it, but whatever of yours is with your brother, your hand shall release. But there will be no poor among you, for the Lord will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance to possess. If only you will strictly obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all this commandment that I command you today. For the Lord your God will bless you as he promised you. And you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And you shall rule over many nations, but they shall not rule over you. And then into our passage. If anyone among you should become poor in any of your towns that the Lord your God has given you, shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother, but you shall open your hand to him. So God's economic plan is that all debts are canceled every seven years. How amazing would that be? Your mortgage, poof. Your student loans, poof. That fear and stress and worry and anxiety that comes with owing such debt, gone. Now you have to let go of your debts as well. It's this comprehensive debt elimination plan on a seven-year cycle. But God's plan is that in his kingdom, he's going to provide enough for us all And he doesn't want debt to be the thing that ruins us. But debt is actually what our whole country is built upon. (laughs) There isn't enough dollars for us actually to have all the dollars that we supposedly own. So we kind of share it and we borrow it and we can't actually afford the houses that we live in or the cars that we drive or the educations that we get. So we just live 
with debt. We live in it. We, we collect it. We accrue it. We're not even afraid of it. And what it does is it creates poverty. It creates this system of the lenders gaining and gaining and gaining and the borrowers losing and losing and losing. God's plan is not that way. It would be nice if our country and if the world operate on this plan, but there's a, a certain word begins with G that would prevent this from ever happening. Yeah, greed. Tell the bank that all their mortgages are just going to disappear every seventh year. And they're like, no, thank you. You sign on the dotted line. I want all that interest over the next 30 years. Thank you very much. It's no longer just sharing what we have. It's owning when we become slaves to the mortgages and all the rest of it. But that's not God's plan. So during these seven years, God has like a temporary relief option whereby everybody's just going to get the relief ultimately, but in the meantime, if someone becomes poor, he's talking about indebtedness here, so I think if someone takes on a huge debt, becomes poor, the thing fails. You know, they, they plant a field and all the crops fail. They become poor. Like, take care of them, because guess what? In the next seven-year cycle, maybe you'll be the one. And there's plenty in the land to feed, and the point is that God has given it to you all, so we should be there to share for one another. So in an Old Testament concept, debt is not God's idea. He's got plans against it, and he doesn't let it own people for a lifetime. It's temporary. In the kingdom that we live in now, the people of God, we look at debt as a permanent condition. I'm always going to have a mortgage. I'm always going to have a car loan. Can't get around going to college, so we got student loans. Gotta have a cell phone, so we, get, like, we just own this stuff and almost don't even think about it. But a lot of times these things become a mountain that then swamp us. How many people have declared bankruptcy? How many people have lost cars that they've had? <clears throat> How many people have lost homes? How many people are living under this tremendous amount of debt? That's not God's plan. And so in this instance, God is saying, Christians, kingdom, if you see anyone among you, that has become poor, help them out. Because God has given enough resources that we can share and we can provide. And he's provided us with a land that's got plenty. And it shouldn't be haves and have-nots. It should be the people of God have everything in common. And that's exactly what you see in the New Testament. So how does this apply to our homeless friends over in Brockton that we'll be sharing a meal with, that we're collecting clothes with? We look at their situation and say, yeah, they're in a really tough place. But good thing God has put churches around them. Good thing God's got Christians around them because they can help to provide. The question is, what will make this go from temporary to eternal? Will our warm winter jackets bring someone into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? That's what our prayer needs to be. Because it's not just about temporary relief, it's about that year of jubilee, that Sabbath, the eternal rest, getting out of the situation that we're in. And so any ministry to the homeless should not just have a tangible thing in the moment, but it should have some way to introduce people to God's plan for a life and God's plan for eternity. So next Sunday is a good opportunity for that too. It's going to be a, a message about why we're thankful to God, what we have to be thankful for and what God has for us, not just in the moment, not just for a lifetime, but forever. So that's the first point. Scripture is pretty clear about that. In God's kingdom, poverty is supposed to be temporary. So we live in God's kingdom now. We're supposed to be working towards that end for individuals, helping them step out of poverty. Let's move forward to one of the prophets, to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49 so past Isaiah, past Jeremiah, up to Ezekiel 16.49. Ezekiel, it's a pretty large book. You should be able to find it, flipping by it. Uh, Ezekiel 16.49. 16.49. So if we're going to say that in the kingdom of God, poverty is supposed to be temporary, the next point that needs to be made is that abundance carries responsibility. 
if we have abundance of anything, abundance or excess of anything, never mind sacrificial, never mind taking what we need and giving that away, which is Christ-like, the abundance is clearly not there for hoarding. The abundance is there for sharing. So Ezekiel 16 and 49 uh, talks about Sodom, talks about Gomorrah. And if you're familiar at all with the Old Testament cities, Sodom and Gomorrah were like the poster children for the worst places on earth. They sacrificed their children. They had all sorts of deviant and corrupt sexual practices. They had all sorts of like heinous crimes that were just openly and wantonly committed in the streets. They're just like free-for-all and the wickedest version of an ancient city that you could imagine. And then probably, and then some. But when God's talking to Ezekiel here about the people of God, the criticism that he gives to Sodom and Gomorrah isn't like where their sins led them. It's like the root of their sin, what they were guilty of. It wasn't just these practices, but it was what we're going to read now. Ezekiel chapter 16, starting with verse 49. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister, Sodom. She and her daughters had pride excess of food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. They were haughty and did an abomination before me, and so I removed them when I saw it. I love how he calls the wicked city their sister. This is that brotherhood of all mankind concept again. You know, the wicked sinful people who live next to us? Yeah, no, that's sister and brother. Because people are people and we all need God's grace. So I love that. <laughs> I love that he doesn't just point at the specific sins. He points at this like root. The guilt that they had. Verse 49. Pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. It's like they had gotten so rich and so content and so comfortable that they felt like they really could do whatever they wanted. And that led to all these practices. Does that at all remind us of where we're at as a country? A life of prosperous ease? Oh, that feels like so many of us, maybe all of us here. A life of prosperous ease. We're supposed to learn from lessons in Scripture. We're supposed to look at cities like Sodom and not be like, oh, whew, good thing I'm not them. We're supposed to look at good and bad examples and say, in what ways is that me too? And what can I learn? God, I want to be more like you. What are you teaching me here? When we look at these verses, we say, let's not be guilty of pride, having an excess of food and prosperous ease, but not aiding the poor and needy. Let's not be haughty, you know, throw our nose up at other people. Because when this group of people did that, God cast them out of the land. He was angry with them. Let's let God bless us rather than incurring God's anger and displeasure. I feel like there's just such a great lesson to be learned here for all of us, myself included, who live lives of prosperous ease. Abundance carries responsibility. It's not just your stuff. All of it has been given by God to provide for us and the people around us. And the reason there's so many parachurch organizations right now, United Way, all these sorts of things, is because the churches themselves have not fully owned their responsibilities for their communities. Churches more and more focus on providing for their congregation, and then the people outside of our walls are kind of on their own. And so these parachurch organizations come around to try to fill in the gaps and care for the needy around when that's really supposed to be the responsibility of the church, something that we feel more deeply than anyone. We all have abundance. That's not a sin. What are you doing with your abundance? Our extras. And then once you've decided what you're doing with the abundance, <laughs> our prosperous ease, what are we doing with our time? Is it all just for us? Are we sharing ourselves? How do we feel about ourselves? Do we feel better than those who are homeless? Or do we recognize we could be homeless? It's God's grace that we're not. 
We are people of abundance. We need to recognize that, that bear, bear, um, it bears and carries responsibility. All right, keep flipping. Let's go to Jesus in Luke chapter 14. Now we're into the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Chapter 14, verse 11. Luke 14, Jesus is speaking, he's healing, he's telling parables. He tells a couple of parables back to back, and they're all about um, humility versus exalting yourself. And so I actually want to read verse 11, which is the summary of the parable before it, because he continues on and just gives another example. And so the point is kind of first. The point is verse 11, and then his example is verses 12 through 14. So Luke chapter 14, verse 11. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite, could insert just, (laughs) do not invite just your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. You will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Christians are supposed to be about caring, not about cliques. We like to hang out with who we like, and we like to hang out with who likes us. We like to give gifts at a birthday party because, no, eventually we'll invite them to our party and they will give gifts in return. We like to compliment someone who smiles at us because, you know, a compliment will be coming back. It's strings attached. We like convenient. We like comfortable. We like safe. We like known. But Jesus is like, the focus is supposed to be on caring, not on forming comfortable cliques. When you have a feast or a banquet, don't just invite your friends. Isn't that like the exact definition of our Thanksgiving meal? Like, just don't invite each other. Invite people who can't repay you so that it's a pure gift. Invite people that are not just your friends, who are not just wealthy, who are not just clean, who are not just nice-smelling or polite or well-spoken. Don't just invite that category of people because if you are, You're not actually representing God's love. Because God doesn't just love the nice-looking, the nice-smelling, the well-spoken people. That's not his heart. He loves everyone. He doesn't have that invisible wall, that barrier. Keep the goods on this side and the bads on this side. He sees the weakness in the good, and he sees all those beautiful strengths in the weak. It's just people. So this passage, if none other, could say, yes, let's have our meal and let's invite some friends to it. What kind of friends do you want to invite to your birthday party? What kind of friends do you want to invite to your Christmas party? Keep this in mind. We've got some Thanksgivings coming up in our homes. Who's going to get to come? Who gets the invite? Who gets the golden ticket? Maybe cast the net a bit wider this year. Think about who you can care for versus just who you like best. Because can't churches become little cliques where we just like who we like? There's nothing wrong with liking each other, but it just, there can be no wall. There can be no containment. There can be no exclusion. It's got to be a people who love each other that have this open arm, open wall, church without wall kind of concept. That's beautiful. People loving each other with then others willing to come in and seeking out, looking around. Who are the unloved? Who need to be cared for? We have excess of food and prosperous ease. Let's not be guilty with just enjoying that. Let's really care about people. I read this one. I felt like, man, Jesus, you are just talking to us right in this moment, and I don't want us to be guilty of just loving each other. Sounds weird, guilty of loving each other. The key word is just. We're not just about us. It's not just about us. We're here because God brought us and he loves us, Tens of thousands of people right around us right now in this community and the ones around us that God loves just as much. We need to show it. We need to care and not be about clicks. James, all the way to almost the end of your Bibles. James chapter 2, verse 14. This is what we'll wrap up with this morning. James 2, 14.
James wrote this letter to the Christian church. James was the brother of Jesus. James was a leader in the early Christian church in Jerusalem. He spoke. He taught. His book is kind of a collection of proverbs. It doesn't read like a story. It reads like a great thought, a great thought, a great thought, a great thought. Some of them relate. Some of them are independent. It's like the book of Proverbs, but a New Testament version of it. And so in this section of James, he's a book of James, letter written by James. He's writing about what our faith is supposed to look like. All right, so James chapter 2, verse 14. This is the question here. What good is it? What good is it? He writes, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but doesn't have works? Can that kind of a faith save him? It's like a deeply philosophical question based on really practical stuff. So he gives an example. So if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith, you know, the things we believe, the things we say we hold on to, by itself, if it does not have works, it's dead. But someone will say, he anticipates an objection here, someone will say, you have faith, you know, you have a strong belief, I have works, I do what I do. James responds, Show me your faith apart from works. I will show you my faith by my works. The main question, what good is it? We should just be willing to ask ourselves, like, what good are we? And hopefully when we ask that, maybe vulnerable or dangerous question, hopefully there's some answers there. What good are we? Oh, well, we're good. Our faith is good for the people around us in this way. I'm good for my unsaved spouse in this way. I'm good, my faith is good for my children in this way. Not just that we have it, but that it like shows up in really practical ways. My faith is good for my spouse because when they sin against me, I understand things like forgiveness and grace and turning the other cheek. I understand things like sin can get a hold of someone and our battle is not against flesh and blood, so I'm not having to be an enemy of this person. I can fight and pray against this attitude. Or habit. That's a super benefit when two people are trying to live life together. You can say we're of benefit to the world around us because we have opportunities to serve in food pantries or soup kitchens or handing out warm winter clothing. We, we can look at those things. And just because we hand out a warm jacket or a bowl of soup doesn't make you a Christian. But if we're a Christian, we should be looking for all the bowls of soup that we can find. What a practical way to love people in the moment. We just have to make sure that it doesn't stay in the moment. It can't just be about the moment. It also has to be for eternity. And if there's any one thing that I would kind of tie this all together with, is saying if we commit ourselves to serve and love others, and that is the goal and the end in and of itself, we are short-sighted and not actually gospel-centered. Gospel means people, sin, God, grace, eternal life. Gospel. But we need to make the gospel come alive to people. And if we sit in our church and just talk about the things we believe, about how much God loves us, then our faith might not be coming alive in the way it should it would be my prayer that some of the people that we have a meal with next Sunday come to love God more because they saw Christians who showed them love and who were just people, just normal people, hanging out together, having a meal. And by seeing that, they're able to see how much God loves them because then we're loving in the moment and there's an open door then to have a conversation to love for eternity. We need to do both. And God's heart is for us to be part of the solution, not just observers of the problem. Let's close in prayer. Father God, 
You do care for us all. Some of us are needy with money and possessions. Some of us are needy with needing hope or feeling depressed. Our needs are deeper and more personal, more private, maybe not as obvious. For those in this room, Father, that are in need in any way, I pray that you would give them hope for the moment and hope for eternity as well. And I pray that you would use the people around them right now, the person in front of them, beside them, behind them, to show them that love. Help us minister to one another. And next Sunday, I pray that you give us opportunities not just be to be help in the moment, but to be open doors to your kingdom for lots of friends forever. Ask your blessing on us as your people, that you would use us on your mission, that you would give us your heart, that you would break our heart for the things that break yours, and that you would give us a joy in loving people the way you do. We thank you for your word. Pray that you would use it to change our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.